here. Uh, thank you all for coming. It seems a bit silly in this uh, intimate group to read from prepared notes, but uh, many of you know me. For those of you that don't, my name is, uh, now I need to read my notes, Raji Jayaraman. I am a professor of economics at ESMT. Um, today, it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome Daniel Lay, who is from the IMF and is going to talk about the 2015 World Economic Outlook. As you probably know, this is an annual publication that the IMF uh, puts out. This is actually the second time you've been here, right? Yeah. The first time was a half decade ago. Yeah. That's how old we've become. Time flies. Um, a half decade ago, Jason, uh, Jason Daniel. I keep yeah. wanting to call you Jason for some reason. There must be an actor. <laughs> Uh, Daniel was here, uh, so welcome back. Okay. Um, Daniel is, let me make sure I get this title right, Deputy Division Chief at the Research Department of the IMF, and he's a macroeconomist, a group that uh, microeconomists such as ourselves uh, sometimes undeservedly probably scoff at, but Jason does really serious empirical work, um, despite the fact that he's a macroeconomist. Um, I, it's a sort of German tradition to read through people's CVs when they come to give a talk. I'm not going to do that uh, because I find it boring and I'm sure Daniel would find it boring as well. Um, so let me just say instead that uh, Daniel's academic credentials are very impressive. So, you know, quite apart from the fact that he's at the IMF, which uh, lends a degree of, you know, gravitas to what comes from his mouth, um, he has serious academic credentials, so you know we should all take him very seriously, and you'll see that in the work that he presents. Uh, what he's going to talk about today is chapter four of the World Economic Outlook, which uh, discusses private investment, particularly in the wake of the not-so-recent anymore financial crisis. Um, after uh, Daniel talks, and you know, depending on how that goes, that'll be 20 minutes to a half hour. Uh, what I'll do, since it's such an intimate group especially, is just open the floor up right away for questions, and if you find yourself tongue-tied, then I'll step in with my own questions. So uh, that way it'll be a little more interesting and a little more interactive for everyone here. So with that, at almost exactly 12.15, uh, this will last for an hour, by the way. Um, let me turn the floor over to you, Daniel. Thanks for being here. Thanks very much, Raji, and uh, thanks Molly and uh, the whole team uh, for arranging this, and thanks to all of you for coming. I know it's a holiday tomorrow, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here again, this beautiful uh, building and, and at the prestigious, prestigious uh, ESMT. Uh, I wanted to talk, as Raji said, about uh, one of the topics that we've got in our latest report, which is... Uh, private investment, what's the holdup? And uh, the reason is that private investment, building factories, by, uh, companies, you know, buying machinery, investing in equipment and software has been very weak uh, since the crisis, so the last few years, very disappointing. And a lot of economists are wondering why uh, there's no consensus. So uh, to shed some light on this, we're gonna look at four main questions. First, to put the debate into global context, we want to know where it's happening. Is it all around the world that investment is weak or just in some parts? The next question is, we all know there was a housing boom and a housing bust, so is this just a housing slump after a boom? A uh, simple story like that. Uh, or is it more broad-based? The next question is the most important one, why? Why are businesses not investing more? Is it uh, that this is a symptom uh, or a cause of, of the sort of overall economic weakness. There are two main views out there. One is that this is a crisis, an exceptional crisis in investment. Something very strange is holding back investment. For example, policy uncertainty. Uncertainty about the future of the euro area, for example, and firms are just terrified and they're not investing. Or is this much more boring, uh, just a sort of symptom of a general weakness in uh, economic activity? and nothing special about investment. Those are the two views out there we're gonna uh, try to uh, inform you on which one is the right one. And uh, finally, to do so, uh, we're gonna go beyond macro data to micro data, uh, so Raji will be happy. And uh, we're gonna look at individual companies. Which ones are the ones that are cutting investment more? Because if you can distinguish what types of firms are investing more or less that can help 
understand the channels, exactly why uh, is investment so weak. So that's the plan. And uh, to start off with the global question, is this a global slump in investment? Well, broadly speaking, no. Uh, it's it's uh, in the advanced economies where there's a really serious uh, shortfall of investment. You can see on, on the second panel that uh, investment, this is total private investment, uh, was kind of rising in the years before the crisis, well, since the 90s, and then the dashes show you where it was expected to go continue going, and then there was a terrific collapse and a failure to recover. That's in the second panel. And in emerging markets, uh, that's the third panel, it's very different. There was actually a very rapid growth of investment that started in the 2000s, and uh, recently there's been a little bit of a slowdown uh, for this big group, but down towards the, the sort of pre-boom forecast. Uh, so it's a slowdown from very high levels. And you may think this is just China, but even when you exclude China in the last panel, you can see also that there's more of a slowdown from unusually high levels than, than the kind of collapse you had in advanced economies. And that's why we're gonna focus for uh, the rest of the presentation on advanced economies. Now, so for the advanced economies, is this just housing? Uh, no, it's broader. You can see that housing investment, residential investment, the first panel, collapsed by about 40% uh, during the crisis. But uh, housing, it kind of punches above its, its weight. It's got a much bigger collapse than other forms of investment, but it's only about one-fifth, 20% of the total private investment. So this doesn't really contribute that much to the total uh, contraction in investment. Business investment, that's the second panel, that's the bulk of investment, 80%. And you can see also that that one uh, has been in a deep slump. And then within investment by uh, businesses, structures and equipment, it's been weak also. So this is a broad-based slump in private investment. Now, why, uh, okay, sorry, this is just to uh, elaborate a little bit. On the left, the blue bars, they show you the contribution to the total slowdown in private investment coming from business investment. And you can see again that this is the bulk of, of the story. And to put it into even broader context on the, on the right, uh, I've shown total investment. So this is not just private, but also public investment. Again, in deviation from the sort of pre-crisis trend. And you can see that almost everything is yellow. That's private investment. Public investment has also been weak. And, and six months ago, in the wheel, we were talking a lot about how weak public investment has been. But if you look at the total amount of investment in the economy, which is about 20% of GDP, public investment has not been a big contributor to the total slowdown in investment, uh, although it's, it's important. So now the, the next question, how do you explain this slump? How much is just a reflection of the weak economy? And here, uh, there's a very challenging question because investment, uh, spending by companies, that goes into GDP, total uh, economic output. And uh, also, of course, when firms see uh, weak uh, GDP, weak sales, weak demand for their product, they also reduce investment. So there's this vicious cycle. The causality goes both ways. So if you want to understand what's causing what, how much of the fall in investment is due to the fall in GDP, you need to have some uh, clever way of, of getting at causality. It's, it's very challenging, so we start with an easier question, which is just to say, you know, after past recessions, investment goes down, output goes down. This time, is it different? Has something strange happened to investment relative to the usual pattern, the co-movement between investment and output? Uh, because if it is the case that investment is unusually weak, then that's already a clue that something strange might be going on, some special constraints uh, beyond just the weak economic environment. Uh, after that first step, we'll get into the statistical uh, instrumental variables approach to try to understand causality more, more exactly. So the first question. Here you see uh, the, what usually happens after recessions. We've looked at all advanced economies, all the recessions since 1990, and uh, on the left, you see in the blue line what investment has done relative to the forecast made just before the recession. Investment falls by about 10%, or a bit more than 10%, and the, the band shows you the range of experience around that average recession. And uh, output, 
during an average recession falls by eventually about 5% relative to the pre-crisis forecast. So there's a ratio here of about two or three to one. Right? Investment falls about two or three times as much as, as output does. That's the usual pattern. And the question is, anything different this time? And the answer is broadly, no. It's true that investment, and those are the colored lines, yellow, red, and green on the left, has fallen about twice as much as in the average recession right, since 2007. Uh, but output, the next panel, output has also been about twice as uh, severely uh, reduced. So there's nothing different in the relative size of these contractions. And the bars there on the, on the right sh show that. The historical recessions, as I said, between two and three times as big a contraction in investment. And then this time, it's uh, anything a bit smaller. That means that investment has not been unusually weak relative to this pattern. But that's not a causal explanation. That's just saying nothing particularly unusual. So to get at the causal story, let me just put this on hold a bit. Uh, here's where we're going to try to estimate for data before the crisis the usual effect of uh, output on investment. Right? As I said, this is a tricky exercise. So how do we do it? We basically want to look at um, movements in GDP that are triggered by something that is not uh, business investment. Right? So a movement in, uh, in overall aggregate demand coming, in this case, from government, uh, cuts in government spending uh, or increases in taxation. It's, it's, uh, uh, the instrumental variable is uh, called uh, fiscal consolidation. So uh, we, we sort of see movements in output coming from this uh, instrumental variable and then the effect that that has on investment uh, is, is the sort of causal effect. That's the, 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 the intuition behind this. Uh, approach. And uh, what do we do? Uh, what do we find? This is the, the sort of um, the main number here in this table is, is the, the first row. It's 2.5. This means that when output falls by 1%, uh, this reduces uh, investment by about 2.5% in this sample. So a coefficient of about 2.5. When you use this and you combine it with what happened to output, right? this time output has fallen by about 10%, you can get a prediction of what should have happened to investment. How weak should investment have been if, if, um, if had followed this historical pattern? And the answer is in this next chart. Panel one, you see that actual investment by uh, businesses has fallen about 20% relative to the pre-crisis forecast. And uh, this is roughly the same as what you'd expect based on what happened to uh, output and this relationship that, I, that we've estimated. So uh, if anything, you see the black line slightly above the red line, not below it. Again, uh, no evidence here of something unusually uh, serious happening to investment. It's, firms are acting normally, essentially, is the, the message you get here. And uh, that's for the overall group of advanced economies it holds for subgroups, those that have banking crises and those that did not. The last panel shows you uh, a slightly different pattern. The, the black line, the actual performance has been slightly better than what you'd expect. And that's because the, 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 this group includes Norway and Canada, company, uh, countries that have uh, experienced a boom in investment related to uh, oil prices going up during this period. So that's something slightly unusual, and that explains it. Okay, so this, though, is still for groups of countries. We then looked country by country. And uh, what we found was something similar. For the main advanced uh, economies, and Germany here is in uh, the third panel, you see that the red line, what you'd expect based on output, is essentially uh, very close to the reality, to what actually happened. And sometimes there are departures, but there are always some departures in a relationship. Uh, we show. Uh, confidence bands, and you'd look at this and you'd say there's, there's nothing really strange going on. Uh, the dashes there show you again the, the sort of trajectory uh, that was expected. And when there are gaps since then, they don't amount to that much if you look at the total drop relative to where investment was going to be. Uh, the gaps are pretty small, right? 
in France here at the end, you see a little bit of a deviation. The black line is below the red line, but again, as a share of the total slump, there's not that much uh, that's left unexplained. But there are some countries where there's more of a puzzle, and uh, the next slide shows you the group of what we now call the selected euro area economies. They used to be called the periphery, uh, Spain, Italy, Greece, and Ireland, and Portugal. And, and th in that group, Italy is the biggest e uh, economy. So you can see here in the middle, something else is going on. In the years up till about 2012, the red line and the black line are similar, investments performing roughly as you'd expect. And then after the sovereign debt crisis, uh, you see actual investment uh, going down and overall activity is making you think, no, the investment should be higher. Firms should be investing more given what's going on uh, in the economy. Uh, there's a puzzling gap. And so why might that be? So we, we did a, a first pass with some um, simple uh, approaches. We took a, a variable that measures uh, financial constraints, because this is a, a big story, right? There was uh, all these diabolical loops between the sovereign debt crisis and the banks, right, who hold the government bonds, and then this all feeds through into the, the overall economy, and firms can't get access to, to uh, credit. So we, we took a variable that actually is based on a survey that the European Commission does. It asks firms, what are the main obstacles facing your business? And one of the responses is financial constraints. And uh, the variable captures the share of respondents saying it's financial constraints. And this captures both uh, banks being in trouble, but also firms being in trouble. So basically financial weaknesses. You add this to this model, which is just based on output, and you get the green line. So this is the prediction when you account for financial constraints. And you can see that actually it's coming closer to the black line, right? Which means that it helps to explain that gap we had before. Um, both in, in Italy and in, uh, even more in Spain. Now, another story is policy uncertainty, uh, right? There's all the discussions about what will happen to the Euro and, and similar uh, debates. Now, how do you measure policy uncertainty as it's perceived, because it's perceptions matter? Uh, Nick Bloom and co-authors have constructed an index that is uh, based on a computer reading newspapers right, and looking for the word uncertainty and uh, interest rates, or uncertainty and budget deficits, uncertainty and inflation. And the count of the number of times this appears in newspaper articles uh, is an index uh, of policy uncertainty. It's sort of how, how much is this being discussed. Uh, when that goes up, uh, that's, that's a spike in uncertainty. And when we add that variable to the model, you see what happens. Uh, the yellow line, again, helps to explain better what is going on, especially in, in Italy uh, and some of the other countries which are in that overall uh, group on the left. So some suggestive evidence that financial constraints and policy uncertainty matter beyond just the usual relationship with output. Now, I say suggestive because this is based on macroeconomic data, and uh, you have only a small number of observations, so you can't be sure exactly what's happening. So we're going to come back to that and look at individual companies to get a, a better sense of what's going on. But just to summarize so far, overall for advanced economies, this is a, is a weak uh, economy story. Right? And uh, just to complement that with some extra evidence from the firm surveys, when you ask companies, uh, why, uh, what's the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is actually not the financial constraints uh, that I mentioned before, which is on the lower panel, it's customer demand. That's the number one constraint. So this is consistent with the evidence I, I showed already, which is that basically this is a, a weak economy story. Now, onto the firm level evidence to give this more gravitas, right? As, yes. Uh, so we want to come back to these two stories, financial constraints and policy uncertainty. And uh, the, the spirit of this is the, the following. If it is the case that financial constraints, not being able to go to get a loan from the bank, for example, if that is playing a major role 
then you should see companies that rely more on borrowing to finance their investment cutting investment by more than the companies that do not need to borrow as much. So uh, Rajan, uh, Rajan and Zingalis came up with this uh, approach originally, which consists of ranking companies according to what percentage of total investment comes from external funds. And so it's an index. And uh, it turns out that what are the companies at the, the top end? Pharmaceuticals, drugs and pharmaceuticals. Those really have to borrow a lot uh, the, to finance their investment, the, there's long gestation lags in, you know, in, their, in their projects. On the other spec side of the spectrum, you have uh, beverages, uh, like uh, breweries. You don't have to borrow that much to finance investment in that sector. So this is the sort of uh, spectrum we're talking about. And what you see is, indeed, um, now let me, let me come back to that in a moment. This the, first, to illustrate it simply in a chart on the left. <clears throat> the pharmaceuticals and the like that need to borrow a lot, that's the red line. And this is just uh, what happened to investment uh, in this, these sectors relative to a sort of univariate trend. And the blue line are uh, the breweries and, and beverages, as, as, as I described. So you can see that the more dependent firms cut investment about twice as much, uh, especially wide. Uh, this gap was especially wide during 29, 2009, 2010, uh, when there was a lot of um, banking crises getting started. And um, we also do a similar exercise for the other story, which was policy uncertainty. Now, how do we do that? This is one of the uh, main innovations of our study. We wanted to create an index, not of financial constraints, but of um, sensitivity, inherent firm and sensitivity to policy uncertainty. So how do we do that? Every one of these firms, because they, this comes from uh, a database called WorldScope, every one of these uh, firms in the database has itself listed on a stock exchange. So you have the stock price, and you can see how much the stock price index um, moves, how strongly it correlates with the Nick Bloom Policy Uncertainty Index I talked about. So uh, you basically look at um, how much do you, does your company's stock move with policy uncertainty once you control for the overall uh, sort of uh, economic uh, index, the overall economy index, right? So everybody's stock is going to move up and down with the, the overall stock market. That's like the first moment relationship. But then the question is whether there's anything left uh, to be explained by the policy uncertainty, which captures sort of the second moment. And it turns out that companies like pharmaceuticals, again, are the ones where there's a stronger relationship with policy uncertainty than uh, companies uh, like, um, like beverages. So this, the, the companies with lumpier and more irreversible sort of, uh, investment projects are more vulnerable to shocks in, in uncertainty. And, and the, the chart on the right shows you that the ones, these ones also cut investment by more than the less sensitive ones. So again, this is uh, just plotting the data, but it already gives you a sense that um, uh, the stories we, we sh described earlier were actually b confirmed in, in the data, uh, the microdata. Now, the, these tables show you the, the exercise done a little bit more carefully, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to judge whether I should get into this by your faces, but I, I, I just want to tell you the bottom line, which is the first row, uh, the, the level of financial dependence interacted with a banking crisis. Is, it, this is a very uh, significant uh, result. It's, it's negative, and it's exactly what you expect, because it just says that when there's a banking crisis and banks are, you know, there's a credit crunch, it's precisely the more financially dependent companies that are cutting back more. So the negative relationship with financial dependence in a banking crisis, that's, that's all it is. And, and the nice thing about this, which is why it's more uh, sort of serious than the chart, is that you control for essentially everything. You've got 160,000 observations, so you can put in all the, essentially all the controls. So you really know that this is what, it, what the, the, the causality is really there. And the, you do the same exercise with the policy uncertainty story. Again, the first row shows you that there's a strong, significant uh, relationship um, in times of high uncertainty, which is like what's been going on in the recent years. Uh, more policy uncertainty sensitivity is associated with lower firm investment. So it just backs up the, 
the chart I, I showed you, um, which, is, which is here. Now, uh, that's really the main, uh, the main uh, part of the analysis. So just to conclude, we saw that this is a, a slump in private investment that's concentrated in the advanced economies, and it's not just housing. Broadly speaking, this is a weak econo economy. So firms are seeing weak sales, both today and in the future. They see no, uh, not much hope, so they're keeping investment low. And uh, uh, basically, uh, the, how, how to think about this in the glo uh, broader context, well, uh, it's really serious because at the beginning of the crisis, in 2008, 2009, we had a big fall in overall aggregate demand. So this, the results here say, uh, yeah, that caused a slump in private investment. That in turn actually means that there's less capital stock being built up. So this reduces potential growth, right, in, in, for, for some time. Firms therefore see in the future less, less hope, less capacity of the total economy. That gives them even less reason to invest. This creates a vicious cycle. And going beyond our study, this comes, on top of this come sort of low frequency forces of uh, lower uh, potential growth because of aging and um, slower technological progress that others have talked about. And again, uh, this, this is a sort of vicious cycle. Now, to turn it around, this is where the policy messages come. Uh, you therefore need to address both the short-run demand deficit and there, for example, the monetary policy, quantitative easing, but at this point, central banks have done almost everything they can, so more on the fiscal front uh, where you can increase public infrastructure, for example. We, we had a chapter, so I'm just reading, keep pushing on this message that in countries where they, they have the space, this is the best time you know, to, to ramp up uh, infrastructure. I can see that in Berlin, this is definitely uh, taking place. Uh, but basically, with this overall approach, uh, companies are going to see the need to invest, and um, uh, that, that, would, that would really turn this around. So I think I'll stop there. Thanks. Would you like to have a seat? Can I get you some thanks. water? OK, thanks. Get yourself some. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, I have a bunch of questions here, but uh, I thought I would start by asking you in the audience if you have any immediate questions. Uh, yes, the gentleman. One, one moment, please. There are microphones going around, so before you ask a question, please make sure you're holding a microphone in your hand. Thank you. My name is Quincy Liu. Uh, you came to the conclusion that it was aggregate demand that is. Uh, discouraging investment. That is uh, distinctly the other story that, for example, the uh, great part of the right wings in the US do not want to accept. The panacea for every economic stress is to lower taxes. They say that if you lower tax, then there will be automatically investment. That really is not what you're saying. Should we take one, one by one? Uh, go ahead, yeah. let's just do this yeah. one by one. Yeah, uh, so I mean, basically, it's true that there's been a big debate in the US, especially some years ago, about why, why is investment so, so weak? And Paul Krugman uh, actually had a, a, a lot of blogs that, that um, relate to what you were just talking about. Right, right. Just a long article in, 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 in the Guardian a couple of days ago, recall, recalling the last seven years of misery uh -huh. of how so-called economic truthers is impervious to em empirical evidence, including mm -hmm. the evidence from IMF. Right. Uh, well, our, our role is definitely to try to bring evidence uh, to the to the debate, and uh, as, yeah, I mean one one big. One big result is indeed that it's it's the the overall um, economy. Now, the the only thing I'd, I'd say is that uh, some of the other factors that people have talked about, uncertainty about taxes or or um, other things, uh, they 
they have been playing a role in some some economies, as, as I showed in the in the chart, right? In in uh, southern Europe, uh, for example. But for the for the most part, we don't see anything unusual happening. Um, you know. uh, maybe I can ask a Sorry, follow, follow up, up yeah. question on that, which is that uh, one of the I think it was the second slide or so um, showed uh, the breakdown of investment by private the private in the public sector. And there I noticed, I don't know how large these magnitudes are, but there I've no, I noticed that pri public sector investment has gone down as well relative yeah. to the prediction. Now, that is a you know staunch Keynesian that strikes me as perhaps not being the right timing um, because you'd imagine that public investment would be counter-cyclical and not, and not pro-cyclical. So what's, what's going on there? Right, right. I think related to the gentleman's yeah. question. No, the public investment has been going down. Uh, we show this in the other report. Uh, there's been a downward trend that started even before the crisis. So um, this was sort of interrupted with the fiscal stimulus. In 2008, 2009, there was an up uptick in public investment, but then it continued its downward course afterwards. Um, the chart actually uh, doesn't show much a deviation from what was expected. It's really about um, deviations from what, we expect, what was expected. It's been weak. It was expected to be weak. And um, yeah, the timing is really uh, right for the opposite in many you countries. That in your last time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, when, when you've got well defined in, uh, infrastructure needs and the right public investment processes uh, with interest rates this low, this is, this is the time to, to, to go ahead. My name is Michael Tolster from Berlin School of Economics. I just wondered when you said at the end that private firms are keeping investment low, mm -hmm. one, one of your final statements. I have seen reports from German firms who have actually kept investment low in this country, but they are global firms and they invested elsewhere, for instance, in the United States. Have you considered that? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's actually a really uh, something we did look at. Is the, is the weak investment um, at home reflecting more investment abroad? Let me just bring up a slide at the beginning, which I think uh, speaks to that very clearly. You see what's happening in, in the second panel. Advanced economies are cutting their investment. And pretty much at the same time, uh, in emerging markets, investment is going up. So the question is whether there's a reallocation going on here. Uh, it looks very tempting to conclude that, right? And so we looked at foreign direct investment. Uh, if we did this experiment, if the foreign direct investment going out of Germany, for example, had been all kept at home, right? Uh, how much difference would that have made since 2007? And we concluded that it would have made some contribution to raising investment, but it's, it's actually a very small part of the total. So if you look at the, the total gap, the total slump, it would barely, you would have barely noticed uh, any, any difference. So this is not a big part of the, the slump, just sort of investment going out. Um, my name is Johannes Jon, I'm a PhD student at ESMT. Um, so when you, um, you identified a policy, a policy uncertainty um, as being important to describe the investment crisis, um, but I wondered um, whether you could, uh, whether you have any idea what exactly is, is important, right? So when you have to take a t talk to a politician on Europe now, would you want him to kind of first do banking regulation or first uh, kind of keep, make sure that Greece stays in the euro or is kicked out or something? Um, right? Do you have any idea about the priorities um, here? Okay. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't have anything really specific to say on on, uh, on that, except that uh, you know, bringing it back to this, the one of the priorities is definitely uh, to deal with the legacies of the crisis, and uh, those legacies mean uh, inclu cleaning up the bank balance sheets. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, way to go on that, uh, and uh, but beyond that, there's a huge mount, mountain of, of 
corporate and, and household debt and government debt. So all of these legacies are acting as a break on, on, on demand. And um, it, uh, it's difficult because with the low growth, it makes it even hard to cope with these legacies. So the, the main advice is deal with the legacies, but be realistic, it's going to take a, a long time. And the timing, therefore, of fiscal consolidation and uh, you know, deleveraging needs to be uh, not, too, not too quick, not too, not too slow. Um, that's what I would say. There's a question over here. Okay, my name is Thomas Jun. I'm working for the Federation of German Industry. Uh, so the German Federation. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, you were concluding that uh, financial restraints will just uh, uh, slow down the investment. Uh, I actually can't see this in Germany. And uh, I really can't see this worldwide. Mm -hmm. Because, point one, uh, I think it has to do with the uh, debate of co, the balance sheet recessions. The companies make money, but they just shift it into the uh, own capital and uh, just repay their uh, debts. And on the other hand, um, we have uh, worldwide a system of fired money. So in Europe, there is no strange with, uh, with money. We have no restraints in the United States. All the central banks are just uh, printing money and so how do you, uh, can you say that there are financial restraints? All right. Uh, let me just step back here and, and, and say one thing about financial restraints in normal times. Uh, the, the message is that financial constraints uh, always matter to some extent. There's this thing uh, called the financial accelerator, which is part of the normal business cycle. So when there's a fall in sales, uh, firms basically find it harder uh, to, to get a loan when, when the economy is just tending down. And it's harder for them to get a loan, therefore they invest less, and this kind of feeds on itself, and it amplifies the business cycle. So financial constraints are part of the normal functioning of the economy, and they, they amplify uh, business cycles. And so when I say that nothing unusual has happened, uh, it doesn't. It, it means that the usual pattern of financial constraints is still there, but there hasn't been a, a sort of drop off the cliff beyond what you'd expect. Right? Now, uh, in some countries, though, so, uh, there is more going on, and, and I already mentioned those a few times. Right? Italy and, and, and the others. There, I think it's it's uh, there's a broad consensus that the banks uh, have been facing serious challenges and. This has made it hard for the monetary policy to, to actually trickle down to the borrowing rates, right? And, and so in that sense, in that broad sense, financial constraints have been a real issue. And, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. As I said, uh, when you actually ask companies, they themselves come up with that as a, as a key challenge they're facing. Now, uh, there's differences across countries, and I agree that in the U.S. and maybe Germany, this is uh, something that has kind of uh, been dealt with uh, more, especially the U.S., right? Earlier on, they cleaned up the banks there. Uh, but um, it, it remains an issue uh, in some places, definitely. Um, Richard Mayapler, I work here at GSMT. Um, I'm wondering um, what do your results imply for the debate on potential output? Um, because there's this huge discussion whether the losses to output are actually permanent or whether we will return to the pre-crisis trend line eventually. Yeah. Um, and yeah, maybe you have some thoughts on that. Right. Thanks. Well, the way this feeds into potential output directly is that, as I said, the fall in aggregate demand at the beginning of the crisis led to less investment and that basically erodes capital formation and, and potential growth. So potential growth gets a hit just because the firms are not investing and that, that le leads to these vicious cycles, right? And uh, we actually have sort of twin chapter in, in the current report in the wheel that looks specifically at potential output more, more, more uh, generally. And uh, the conclusion is that potential 
the level of potential output is, is probably not going to go back to the trends. So if you, if you remember this chart, I showed this for investment, right? The pre-crisis trends in the dashes, we're probably not gonna see uh, a total recovery back to that line, right? We certainly don't expect it right now. And the, the analysis of potential output more generally beyond capital formation says that the total economy potential is also not gonna come back to the old trend. But uh, that doesn't mean that this is all permanent either. There's still a, a sufficient amount of slack, uh, a lot of slack in, in, in some economies, right? Very high unemployment. So that's why we also emphasize the demand deficit. And um, uh, the two really are related in the sense that if investment, if we find a way of turning around investment, that's gonna help to uh, raise a potential output. But we shouldn't be, we shouldn't have illusions. We're not going to go back to the sort of pre-crisis trends. Let me ask a couple of questions. Yeah. Oh, sorry, there's a question here. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm Lea Steinacker. I'm also a PhD student here at ESMT. And when you were, ta I, I would like to come back to the question of financial constraints. Um, I was wondering if you could give some more insight whether you think that the financial constraints are on the side of the banks or the, the bond markets, for example, or rather on the side of the firms. So basically, is there enough liquidity in the market that's just not distributed? Or is it actually something on the side of the banks where, where you actually don't have money that could be actually invested into the firms? And that's really exactly pointing at the... GIPS countries, I, I don't remember how you called them, but the like periphery states. Selected European economies. Okay. <laughs> Selected Euro European economies. economies. Yeah. Select, yeah. Um, so there we know there are banks which have a lot of problems. And whether you think that actually the firms are have high enough of a creditor rating to actually be eligible to receive funds or if, yeah. Right. Uh, is it weak firms or is it weak banks, essentially? Uh, let me let me to talk to that. Let me pull up one of the micro-based tables here. I'll come back to it in a moment. Now, uh, essentially, what our exercise has done is uh, it, it can't distinguish those two uh, because what we what we've got. I can actually show this now. Uh, as I said, we've got the interaction between a banking crisis and uh, financial dependence, and that's. That's what the result is, the negative. So in, when there's a banking crisis, firms that are more financially dependent cut investment more. But a banking crisis, in a banking crisis, firms are also very weak, right? Because, uh, because of actually the accelerator type of, of uh, mechanism I mentioned to before. There's a big fall in sales. Uh, firms therefore have weaker prospects, weaker balance sheets, and it's harder for them to get a loan. And so this could just be picking up a uh, very serious version of the usual weak firm story. And uh, we wouldn't know uh, if there's anything left uh, to do with the banks. So to, to distinguish these two, we, we added a yet another control, which is the next row, recession times financial dependence. Because this kind of uh, weak firm's story comes up in normal recessions. So th that's just a dummy saying there is a recession. Is it the case that more financially dependent firms cut investment more in recessions? And uh, actually, um, when you have it on its own, it's not shown like this, that there is evidence of that. But um, if this was all that were happening, the weak firms, then you'd have this variable basically knock out a lot of the explanatory power of the banking crisis. And the fact that the banking crisis uh, remains very uh, important in terms of explaining what's, what's happening suggests that there's more going on than just the weak firm story. But having said that, I can't also say that it's, it's got nothing to do with weak firms. It's basically both, but it's, it's not only the weak firms. That's, I think, the, as far as we can go with this. And beyond that, uh, I'll just refer you to a lot of research that's going on. Actually, this, there's not that much research yet that has uh, been able to distinguish between weak banks and weak firms in the recent years. It's very topical. so. Probably uh, people here doing PhDs on on, on related uh, issues. I think so far, so we wait. Uh, so far, uh, the evidence I've seen is saying that both are active. So it sort of confirms what I what I was saying. 
following up on Leah's question, um, one of your last statements was about how companies will see the need for investment. And I'm wondering, in countries like Greece that score so low on the doing business index, um, the lack of good infrastructure and just the, um, I don't know, maybe high taxes or um, it, these factors in general, would that um, somehow disappear um, when other factors you mentioned, like policy, uncertain, uh, policy uncertainty and so forth, are addressed? Or would those factors um, still remain? In the background, there's there's always these uh, these other factors that weigh on output, um, and uh, our story is is really going to say something about these situations. When, when firms are facing, um, I was going to say, when when there's a weakness in in general activity, then some of these results speak to that. But I think. In the case of uh, Greece and other countries, you, you mentioned, as I said, that there's there's more going on, policy uncertainty. Um, I think I, I think we've gone over this, but I I, I think you're, um, you're you're getting at something that I haven't gone into in greater detail. I, I just I've got this policy uncertainty index, and um, it doesn't unpack it. It would be nice to unpack it beyond beyond this overall. Uh, Newspaper-based index, um, but that would be probably something for, for, for future research. If I can ask a, a yeah. quick follow-up question on that, it seems like you know, going back to your final point, that what's needed is uh, some way to boost demand, and one way to do that is through public infrastructure investment. And it, it seems to me that many of the countries that are suffering the most in the current crisis or really haven't managed to come out of it in any substantial way are precisely those with really big fiscal problems. Um, so your prescription in terms of increased public infrastructure investment, yeah. say, would seem not to apply to these to the countries that would seem to need this most and, and bring them more likely to, you know, violate the, the Eurozone conditions or, or IMF conditions. How, how, how do you square those two? Right. Well, the, the issue of fiscal space, being, being able to afford um, the extra investment is, is is obviously central. What I'd say is that one of the sort of provocative findings of the of the report we came out with six months ago was that uh, if, and this is maybe a big if, but if the infrastructure is productive, right, and if you build a, a road that really uh, raises output, then uh, the extra boost to, to GDP you get can be enough to actually not increase the debt to GDP ratio, and that's a, an important variable that, that people look at. So debt divided by GDP, because GDP is going up, actually... It's a bit Laffer curve, isn't it? Uh, well, uh, it's slightly different, because the Laffer curve is, uh, is more about the taxes. Right. So it's not the same as saying that... it's in the spirit that, of the Laffer it's curve. It's in the spirit of paying for itself. Okay. And what's interesting is that this finding was not just a sort of a best case scenario. It was, it was a statistical, uh, sort of econometric thing. Uh, the average effect. Mm -hmm. So with all the inefficiencies that you typically see, that's part of the average effect, and you got this result that the debt to GDP ratio really doesn't go up uh, on average. And now, this is, this is I, I understand yeah. the econometric exercise yeah. or the spirit of the econometric yeah. exercise, but in the background I suppose are quite gross assumptions regarding the functioning of institutions, lack of graft, uh, efficiency, and well, yeah. I mean, what I'd say is that all of the all of the above, you know, what you just mentioned, is is in the the real world and is actually being picked up in the average effect. I see. So that's right? more. So as warts well, and, and all, what you get is this result that debt doesn't really go up as a share of GDP. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, you can throw caution to the wind. It, it's uh, it's definitely important to make sure you've got the right kind of projects, and um, you have to definitely bear in mind the whole uh, deficit and the other fiscal indicators and how the markets will react to that. But it's still a, an important thing, I think, to bear in mind. Uh, 
Another point that you had in, in one of your last slides when you were trying to reconcile the gap between the predicted and the actual outcomes in the selected advanced economies. I understand the, the spirit in which you, you add uh, fiscal constraints and policy uncertainty to be able to reconcile that gap. Right. But I was wondering if, and I know you're probably uncomfortable doing this because you're a serious econometrician, but to the extent that one can make a leap of faith into going from there to any kind of policy ramifications, given that this seems to be important in reconciling the gap between predicted and actual outcomes, what can be done? We've talked, uh, what can be done then to ease fiscal constraints of these companies and policy uncertainty as well, if those are the two main uh, features? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the financial, financial constraints. Right, <coughs> financial constraints. Yeah. Well, basically the uh, constraints come about because of the, the weak banks and the, the weak firms. And on, on the how to deal with weak banks, there's a whole yeah. debate on, on uh, cleaning out the balance sheets, you know, completing the banking union, um, making sure that um, you know there's the that it's all done quickly and efficiently. Uh, on the on the weak firms, it's a little bit more involved. I mean, how do you deal with uh, debt overhang? Uh, it's it's really it's not simple. It can take a long time, but um, uh, it's some some something we haven't really. <laughs> it's beyond the scope of our, our study, but um, uh, you know it's it's something that um, the, the sort of legal uh, framework. Uh, the, 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 some some countries have laws that make this easier than others, and and so it's a question of learning from. From uh, from the experience and the policy uncertainty part. The policy uncertainty. That's that's a trickier thing. How do you reduce uh, uncertainty? I mean, just look at look at some of the spikes. Um, it, it's really about you know it's, it's a whole vast area. But um, I'd say one 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 area on monetary policy. Uh, there's there have been some episodes uh, where markets were sort of uh, surprised by some, uh, uh, you know, it's about preparing the grounds, avoiding surprises, in careful communication. Um, and I think more generally resolute action, both uh, to deal with the demand deficit, but also for, for structural reform, uh, that can create a sort of confidence boost and reduce policy uncertainty. But we st we're still trying to find out exactly uh, how, how, how to bullets. do that, you know, there's yeah. probably no magic bullets. I uh, had another question that I realize is only peripherally related to, but you mentioned it on the first slide, so let me, let me ask you. Um, you mentioned that, you know, obviously when we first heard about the financial crisis, mm -hmm. what everyone talked about was the housing bubble, the burst of the housing yeah. bubble. Um, and you pointed out that there's also this drop in private investment that had nothing to do with the housing crisis. But was there a sequence? How did, how, how did, how did those two things fit together? Did one precipitate the other? Right. Uh, the, how does the housing weakness, housing feed, investment did it weak feed into? into the, yeah. I think the, the case of Spain is, is worth uh, considering there because they had a huge housing uh, boom and housing bust. and. Uh, Clearly, it had a big effect on the overall economy. Right? The, the housing bust reduced household wealth. Uh, the lower investment and the lower construction meant a lot of people were out of work, and so this created the, the kind of worst conditions uh, for for firms to go out and start investing. It's really a big disc break on on any appetites for for business investment. So I see this as um, an important. Uh, sort of chain reaction. So important, in fact, that we used it a little bit uh, in this instrumental variable approach. So I, I said that we, we looked at the causal effect of output on uh, business investment by looking at fiscal consolidation shocks. Right? When the government cuts spending, that reduces output, that reduces investment. Uh, another approach we used was to look at housing uh, busts, housing shocks because exactly of this uh, causal process that it's a big housing wealth uh, 
uh, shock, it reduces consumption. Households uh, therefore demand less products and then firms stop investing. So this is another neat way of identifying the causal effect from aggregate demand uh, on, on, an, on business investment. And when we use that, we got a similar result. So in terms of getting out of this crisis, you yeah. said that uh, depressed demand is one of the main culprits uh, in terms of weak investment. Do we need to wait then to the extent that housing prices then, as you argued, seem to feed into consumer demand more generally? Do we, will it only be when housing prices are maybe not at you know, bubble heights, but at normal heights, whatever normal is, that we'll truly see ourselves out of this crisis? No, I think that a big trigger was, in this case, um, a fall in housing wealth, but uh, that's not the only way that you can get the economy going. Uh, housing is not the only engine, so we don't have to wait until, uh, you know, obviously it will help if there's a recovery in the housing market, but uh, there's so much else that you can do, uh, and that was done. Uh, the, uh, first there was the stimulus plans, then there's monetary policy. Uh, stimulus, the quantitative easing in, in the euro area now, for example, that's going to have a positive effect, uh, which goes well beyond housing. It's one of the channels, but it, it um, it's a much uh, broader broader approach. We don't want to just focus on on one sector. I think. If uh, there are no, f uh, let me ask one final question, and then and then we'll wrap this up. And that's about. I mean, first of all, I love this stuff. This is clearly very careful empirical work, and as an academic, I think it's, I think it's great. Um, as someone that reads the title of this report, though, which is World Economic yeah. Outlook, mm -hmm. I look at this and I say, well, you know, it's, it's great. You know, you managed to ex post predict what happened, so you clearly have a good, a great model of the past, but, um, how, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that the 2007 World Economic Outlook did not predict the 2008 financial crisis. I may be mistaken, I haven't read it, but correct me if I'm wrong. So, like, what do I take away from this except that now we have a great model of the past? I love that, by the way. You know, yeah. I do it every day. Yeah. That's that's my bread and butter. But if for those of you know people here who are interested in policy ramifications, like what do I, what yeah. do I take away from this? Well, I think uh, yeah, a lot of science is uh, trying to predict the past, as it were. Mm -hmm. is, is hard enough, right? Uh, it's, that's right. It's very hard it, to do this. Historian so. said that. I think, uh, but um, anyway, the World Economic Outlook. We're always trying to get the best models for predicting uh, the future and that's that's our that's our role um, we uh, we have a chapter as I said that looks at the title is uh, where are we headed and so it, it marries the analysis of investment with an analysis of demographics and uh, TFP and everything that goes into our long-run fortunes so that's our job. We try to. We try to. I would say one thing. Uh, currently, uh, the forecasts for um, 2015 and 2016. For a long time, we kept revising uh, them down. This is the first time in, in years that we've not changed our mind about about the future since January. So we'll see if, wow. if this is a, a, the new beginning <laughs> of months. more accurate uh, predictions. But. Uh, yeah, this is this is uh, this is so our where job. are we headed? I, we didn't get to that point. Where we're headed is uh, basically uh, a new normal with uh, potential growth uh, that is not going to be as high as it was before the crisis. I mean, um, in advanced economies, as I said, there's aging going on. That means less and uh, less labor force participation uh, because of that. Uh, then you've got the uh, ICT, information technology boom, that's kind of, it was fading already before the crisis, that come, keeps going. And then you've got the, the problem with uh, investment. So under the current set of policies, it's not looking uh, good. It's looking like the new mediocre, as they say. But uh, what I'm hoping is that some of the things I was talking about to turn this around can, can happen. Uh, deal with the, the demand deficit, do the structural reforms. So let's hope that um, you know we're headed to something better. <laughs>
Okay, on that cautiously optimistic note, uh, let me <laughs> thank Daniel Lay very much again for being here, and thank you all for coming as well. Thank you very much.